The first MLS playoffs with Lionel Messi have arrived, and the league is seeing what it can do with its biggest star on its biggest stage. Plus, we're getting a look inside the brand new $2 billion Intuit Dome, and we're hearing about the strange world of NBA parody accounts. We also have stories from the NBA, NFL, college football, and MLB. It's Wednesday, October 23rd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're speaking with Taylor Twellman, who is tasked with broadcasting every Inter-Miami game in the MLS playoffs. We chat about what it's like covering the greatest to ever play the game. We're also getting a report on the LA Clippers' new home, which may be the most anticipated NBA venue ever, from our reporter Colin Salau. Senior reporter AJ Perez looks into NBA parody accounts on social media and how they get fame and money when people believe them. First, hear your top headlines. The Boston Celtics opened up the NBA season against the New York Knicks last night, but not before their first championship ring ceremony in 16 years. They hoisted their 18th banner, taking the lead back over the Lakers for the NBA's winningest franchise of all time. And don't forget that this team is still for sale with salary commitments that approach $1 billion for their starting five alone. Despite that, they will blow past the Suns' record sale price of $4 billion and probably with plenty of room to spare. Ahead of the season opener, NBA teams signed a flurry of nine-figure extensions. The Nuggets will retain Aaron Gordon for the next four years at a price tag of $133 million, while three different Jalens, Suggs, Johnson, and Green, all saw their rookie contracts extended. Suggs and Johnson, cornerstones for the Magic and Hawks, respectively, each got $150 million, while Jalen Green's extension with, a, with Houston totals $106 million, but includes a player option in the third year, making it the first rookie extension in this format ever. The Pelicans also extended promising wing Trey Murphy III to a four-year deal worth $112 million. On to the NFL, the Detroit Lions' Jamison Williams was suspended for two games for violating the league's performance-enhancing substances policy. The Lions will miss him as Williams already has career highs with 364 receiving yards and three receiving touchdowns only six games into the season. This isn't the first time the league has suspended Williams as he served a four-game suspension last year after violating the NFL's gambling policy. From the pros to college, the NCAA had another record-breaking viewership after last weekend's game between Georgia and Texas. The matchup averaged 12.9 million viewers and peaked at 14.1 million, making it the most watched college football game of the season so far. It was also the largest regular season broadcast for ESPN since 2016. We've been saying this a lot on the show, but it is still worth noting that this regular season college football game averaged more viewers than last year's World Series, NBA Finals, and the Stanley Cup Final. Once again, football is king. And it wasn't just the SEC setting viewership records this weekend. Sunday's Game 5 matchup between the New York Liberty and Minnesota Lynx drew 2.15 million viewers, making it the most watched WNBA Finals game this century. In fact, no WNBA Finals game has passed the 1 million mark in viewership since 2008 until this year in which all five games broke a million. The MLS playoffs are here, and this will be the first time that Lionel Messi is in them. In a little over a year, Messi has transformed both his team, Inter-Miami, and the entire league. My next guest, Taylor Twellman, will be chronicling his run through the playoffs as Apple TV's lead analyst. He spoke with me about that assignment, what Messi has meant for the league, and why Inter-Miami was the worst team in MLS before Messi came on board. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by the lead MLS analyst on Apple TV and former player Taylor Twellman. Welcome, Taylor. Hey, buddy. How are you? Great. Great to have you on. So um, let's just take a quick look, if we can take a quick look, back at the uh, the MLS season that just was. Uh, what defined this season for you? Lionel Messi. Uh, the, the, the fact that he missed 15 games and had more goal contributions than anyone In Major League Soccer, the fact that his team was without him for nine regular season games in the middle of the summer, they won eight of them. And the fact that Inter-Miami set the record uh, for most points in a regular season. I think when we look back five, 10, 15 years down the road, as good of seasons as Columbus had, uh, LA Galaxy, LAFC, whatever it may be, everyone's going to remember that it's the first time any team had two 20 goal scorers uh, and their names were Luis Suarez and Lionel Messi. Yeah. And, you know, last year when Messi joined Inter Miami, they were not a good team. They were last place in MLS. So obviously he helped, but his presence as, and, you know, as someone that other players want to play with and see this as this huge privilege, um, that obviously is is part of the picture too. It is. Oh, and I think it's important, though. The reason why they were so bad is they were they were trying to get themselves ready 
for Lionel Messi. And what I mean by that, because of the roster rules and regulations within Major League Soccer, they didn't want to sign in anyone if they knew Lionel Messi was going to come along with Sergio Busquets, Jordi Alba, follow me. So they needed to keep a lot of space open in order to make the wholesale changes that they wanted to. And that was part of the reason why they were bad at the beginning of the year, because they needed to make sure that if Messi comes, they're going to be ready. And they were, they bring in Busquets, they bring in Alba this year, they bring in Luis Suarez. And then here we are. I'm not taking anything away from their resurgence, but I just think we need to be cognizant that they struggled because they knew they had a real shot of getting messy and they didn't want to make any signings that would, you know, conflict with who he wanted to bring with him. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I didn't have that piece of the picture, but yeah, it being all one story, uh, you know, makes it's the messy whole and friend cr- zone. If they're going to bring messy and friends, they can't sign anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, as a broadcaster, does messy make your job easier or harder? Uh, harder because I don't know how you describe it anymore. I mean, I, you know, you, you could hand me a thesaurus or a dictionary. I mean, what, what do you want me to use with words on how to describe what I'm watching? The fact that this last regular season game of the year, they're losing two nil. They go in at halftime. It's two, two Messi comes on the field. He has a hat trick and an assist in less than what? 18, 19 minutes. I, what do you want me to do? He just did that in world cup qualifying. So any of your listeners are saying, well, it's major league soccer. Really? Cause he just did it in world cup qualifying the exact same thing. I it, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a privilege. It's just more difficult because I don't know how to describe it anymore. Yeah, and well, I'm, I'm going to make you try in a sec. I just when you watch old clips of him, it's it's like everyone else is moving in slow motion. He's just a lot faster, and he, he's a lot faster, and he's controlling the ball than everyone else. Um, what what's his style of play now that you know he's older? Uh, I would say just not as frequently playing at a high speed. He, you know, we anyone that watches Messi will notice he quote unquote walks a lot but it's always in position to release the pressure when his team wins the ball. He's not going to defend a ton. And so you're often going to be a man down in defending structure and defending moments. But what he brings you on the other end, you're willing to live with that. If you measured from when he was 25 to 30 with Barcelona to now, the high intensity runs, the ability to buzz around, that's not there. However, he still has that little burst of pace that makes him very difficult to defend. And I find that remarkable at age 37, that he has still found a way to be quicker, more dynamic in those key moments. He's not going to do it for 90 minutes, but he's going to make your life miserable for the 25 minutes that he's operating a high clip. It's just different, Owen. It's just in between the ears. I've said this multiple times on broadcast between the ears. He's just different. You know, he thinks the game, he sees the game at a higher level than everyone else. And that includes the likes of Thierry Henry and David Villa and Xavi and and Zlatan Ibrahimovic. All these names I could give you, they would all tell you he just operates at a different level than everyone else. And that's why he's the greatest of all time. You know, soccer broadcasting, you know, has... As you know, the, the European tradition that I think of is very poetic and, you know, kind of weaving this this story, as as you call the game. American sports are more used to kind of something more straightforward and also replay. Like, you know, most American sports stop every few seconds and say, oh, well, let's look at that again. Break it down into minute detail. Um, do you find yourself pulling from any particular tradition as you call games? I've just being a an American that grew up in American sports that played American sports at a high level, whether it was baseball, soccer, golf, I've had to adapt. And I think ESPN gave me the best gift. And I would say, I, I always say internship, but the first three, four years of my 13 years at ESPN, I worked with so many different people, Ian Dark, John Champion, Adrian Healy, Glenn Davis, JP Della Camera. I can go through the gauntlet of names. I probably had Owen oh, 10 play by plays. And it was the best thing for me because I saw 10 different ways to skin a cat. But what I noticed is the European English way is they are storytelling using the game to tell that story. The American way is they are traditional play-by-play people that want to tell you 
in the moment, the story of the season versus maybe the story of the club, the story of the history. It's just a different way of looking at it. Uh, I really enjoyed learning. I really enjoyed being uncomfortable and learning a different way of doing it. I love watching my American colleagues and all the other sports, and I still do that to this day. But I am trying to weave in a few different things without going away from my, you know, my natural uh, American, whatever you want to call it, background. I still like seeing different things. And I just think ESPN really gave me a gift in those first three or four years of honestly working with so many different people. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, beyond Inter Miami, where's the most excitement for you in these playoffs? Uh, the fact that anything can happen in one off games. And I think that's where this gets really intriguing. I mean, last year is a great example. St. Louis City won the West, they played the eight seed Sporting Kansas City, they lost in two games. I think the first round matchups, because of the three games, it is set up to allow the higher seed that had the best regular, the better regular season advance. But then in those games, own oh, anything can happen. And I'll say this as good as Inter Miami were this year and their record setters, they give up a ton of chances. They are risk versus reward. And on one day, if you're good and you punish them, you can beat them. And so it is not that far fetched. Yes, they'll be every game will be in Miami, but Owen, it won't be that far fetched for a team like Columbus to surprise them. It really won't. And that's where this gets intriguing. I think the LA Galaxies, the LAFCs, the Seattle Sounders, uh, Real Salt Lake's got a chip on their shoulder. They play in altitude. The excitement to me is in the cup tournament with one game and the home field advantage being there. It just, it, it's kind of a crapshoot. I think it's fun to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the MLS playoffs, they come at a time when there's a lot of competition for attention among the American sports fan world series is about to start, uh, you know, NFL playoff or not playoffs, but NFL is happening. College football, NBA is starting up. NHL just got underway. Um, what do you think the league needs to do to, to get attention around the playoffs? I think that's an ongoing discussion. I think the one thing having been in this league as a player now broadcaster for over 23 years, almost it's, it's crazy to say that number is they're always willing to evolve and to adapt and to find that. Now, listen, I think any sports fan loves a do or die game. And what I've seen is the playoffs have that tendency to lean towards the non MLS soccer fan that will tune in because of that. If you throw Messi into the equation, they're going to watch and do that. But I think eventually the league will look at things and look at the schedule and do they change it? Do they find a way to maybe have the most important games opposite of the NFL and college football, but make no mistake about it. I've done many in MLS cups, if not 10 of them or, or 11 of them, whatever the number is, people will tune in for the do or die game in any sport. And so you get that by the time the playoffs really get going, the world series Owen's going to be over with. And so, and, and when you look at the beginning of the NHL, the beginning of the NBA, you're really only talking about college football in the NFL. And quite honestly, the NBA and NHL want to avoid college football and the NFL. That's just kind of the way that, you know, the, the climate is in American sports. But I do think there's a time of conversation where MLS may look at the schedule and say, you know what, maybe, maybe we can do things a little differently. But the games are going to be important this year because the greatest of all time is going to be in them. The World Cup is coming in 2026, as you may have heard, uh, to the U.S. and Canada and Mexico. Uh, how do you see MLS kind of, you know, making little adjustments over these next, you know, this past year and the, the next couple of years to uh prepare themselves for for as big an event as they can possibly get i mean owen what's interesting is next summer they've got the club world cup and they're going to have two participants in the seattle sounders in inner miami with Lionel messi and inner miami kicking the tournament off in miami um I, listen there's more eyeballs on this league than there ever have been because Lionel messi and inner miami and suarez and all of them are here Eventually, it's going to be Griezmann and Lewandowski and all of these players coming here and whatever it is. But with the World Cup coming here, you now have the infrastructure, the stadiums, the clubs. You now have 30 teams where when the 94 World Cup came here, there was nothing there. There was an idea that the league's going to come after the World Cup, and that's going to be in 96. It's very difficult for me to quantify what the magnitude of the World Cup is going to do for Major League Soccer. I, I, I don't know how to do that. 
Because if I compare it to 94, it's apples to oranges. I also think you look at the climate of soccer viewership in our country. It is exponentially different than what it was in 94 with the Premier leagues on the uh, games on the weekend. There's just so many different games. You and I now can watch any game in the world in the United States. We couldn't do that in 94, let alone 2004. So I just think Major League Soccer really wants to be ready. When January 1st, 2026 begins, when everyone is paying attention to the United States, Canada, and Mexico, that they have that league rocking and rolling and ready to showcase what this country is all about supporting the sport. And then the moment the World Cup is over, that league picks up again, starts again, whatever it is, they're ready to rock. And I think they're going to be ready because I think Messi has been this rocket ship to the moon, the way Eddie Q and Apple like to describe it. I think it's put a little bit of uh, some gas behind everybody and getting them ready. And I think Major League Soccer will be. Yeah, I think so too. Taylor Twelman, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, brother. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. In 1990, Ken Griffey Jr. and Ken Griffey Sr. made history as the first father-son duo to take the field together in MLB history. They were at last night's Lakers-Timberwolves game to watch that same moment in the NBA with LeBron and Bronny James. Bronny James receives outsized attention for a fringe NBA player because of his famous father, and that's even true when it comes to the betting markets. He has had more bets placed on him for Rookie of the Year than any other player. That's likely money those bettors will never see again, but to be fair, Bronny is an intriguing long shot. Depending on where you bet, a $10 wager could turn into a $2,500 to $10,000 payout if he defies the odds. The likelihood of that is low enough that this is probably just free money for the sports books. And in case you think these bettors might know something you don't, Bronny was a popular pick to be the top pick in the NBA draft when in fact he was the final pick. From the start of one season to the end of another, the World Series between the Yankees and Dodgers is expected to be the most popular series in years, and we're already seeing that in ticket prices on the secondary market. Tickets for Game 1 in Los Angeles start around $1,300, and a handful of people are seeing if they can get six figures for their seats. At the time of recording, the priciest offer was for $233,000 and change. It's a similar story once the series shifts back to New York, with a get-in price between twelve dollars and $1,300, and at least one ticket seller looking for $87,000 for their seats. If you're willing to compromise just a little, you can get decent seats for the mid-20,000s. Or just watch on TV. And as big as the series will be in the U.S., it might be bigger in Japan. For some of the games in the Mets-Dodgers series, Japanese viewership beat American viewership. Having Otani in the playoffs is the best thing that's happened to MLB in a long time. To a less glamorous MLB team, the A's plans in Sacramento and maybe Vegas are shifting before they have started. The team announced that it is reversing course on a plan to turn Sutter Health Park in Sacramento into a turf field and will keep it natural grass. The team had planned to switch to turf because the field will be accommodating both the A's and the River Cats, which is the Giants AAA team, but players raised concerns about playing on turf in triple-digit weather. Sacramento had its hottest 20-day stretch this past summer with an average temperature during that period of 103.8 degrees and a high of 116. Grass will be good for the players as long as the team holds up their end of the bargain on maintaining the field. Meanwhile, we're still waiting to hear how the A's are going to fund their Vegas stadium, and the cost of that stadium might be rising as plans become more concrete. The team's funding presentation could happen at a stadium authority board meeting on Halloween or the following one on December 5th. Whenever they do, don't expect an especially tough hearing. The stadium authority is chaired by Steve Hill, who has become the A's primary public mouthpiece. It doesn't seem like there's anyone watching the Watchmen here. 
The Intuit Dome was created to be a new kind of American sports venue. Clippers owner Steve Ballmer is a co-founder of Microsoft. He's one of the richest people in the world, and he was willing to spend what it took to make this the arena of his dreams. My colleague Colin Sala went to LA to check it out, and he joins us next. I am joined now live from the Intuit Dome by front office sports reporter Colin Salow. Welcome, Colin. Hey, Owen. It's nice to be able to talk to you. There might be some noise in the background because I'm <laughs> yeah. here in like the, the 200 section of the Intuit Dome, but we'll make this happen. Yeah, I'll try not to get distracted by the multicolored visual displays going on behind you. Um, how different is this from your standard NBA arena? Uh, so I, I'm from Chicago and we have the United Center and I could tell you that this is this is night and day as you know the color changes behind me. Um, everything you could think of that's kind of intuitive and efficient. You know, maybe it's not always going to be the easiest experience uh, for fans because there's so many things new. But just this is this is what I would call like all of the new technology that we've seen kind of coming together into an arena and um, but also done in a way that is very uh that is that is very consumer focused not just fan focused but consumer focused right like the the, the players the opposing team's players the the fans the referees of the other side of of the games like these are this is this arena is very you know consumer focused and it's it's very 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 interesting to to see and yeah, let's start with the fan experience. So if you're sitting in your seat, maybe you're getting some concessions. You're just, what, what's, how, how does this whole thing operate? There's so many things I can get to, but I think the best example, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about the, the chairs, right? Um, you know, these chairs that you can see to my left here are, um, they, they have, you know, um, places where you could charge your phone. They also have like buttons. And I, it was very interesting to, to, to talk to this spokesperson because he was saying like, if you've ever been to a sports game, you know, there's like those like races where you can choose who's going to win between the three competitors for like some Dunkin' Donuts race or something like that. Um, you can press the button and vote who's going to win the race and you know which, who in the arena is voting for who. Um, and then ultimately, if someone wins they're going to send you your price automatically to the app that you have to download and you know that that can be not very intuitive for some people but it's very much i i think what they're looking for is that it's a streamlined process and that in time it's going to be a lot easier for fans so there's a lot of the things are involved that go through this like software that they have this app that they have all the way from like if you're gonna buy from their team store uh, and yeah, you mentioned like visitors' locker rooms, referee locker rooms. Uh, what's what's different there? You know, I was talking to their spokesperson, and I I heard, um, I, I said, you know, it feels very you know fan centered. You know, even outside, there's a sign that says like, you know, that we want this to be a fan experience. But he corrected me, and he said like, it's not just for the fans. It's 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 for it's every single person that's going to use this arena. Um, there is a area for referees where they have their own conference room they have their own like area where their families can hang out and they told me that that was simply because they asked the referee a, a union you know what are you guys looking for at arenas um and that's something that's you know clearly that they paid attention to another thing is for like the visitors locker room they have their own gym in the visitors locker room they have their own kind of baths uh, like ice baths and recovery areas and when you walk out into the hall of the visitors locker room, tomorrow night is their you know opening game against the Phoenix Suns. You're not going to see LA Clippers plastered on the wall as you walk out. You're actually going to see the logo of your team. And it already says Phoenix Suns in the visitors locker room. They, they admitted that they wanted to feel like a home as well for the visitors. So in that case, it's, it's very clear that it's not just fan centric, but it's total consumer centric. Yeah, and I have to think if you're a visiting player and you come here like once or twice a year, I kind of think like this is really cool. And like maybe like might be nice to play 41 games here. Um, uh, and how about the wall? You know, this like um, European soccer inspired, you know, was it 50 something row of seats that uh, is just like all Clippers fans? Um, you haven't experienced a game there yet, but what is it like to just see the actual wall? 
Yeah, well, I will say first, stay tuned to you know my coverage here tomorrow and and front office sports coverage as we're going to be standing at the wall during the game to feel that experience. But you know, if you look at it right now, it's actually right across me. I don't know if you could see it in the picture, but it's it doesn't it looks normal. It actually just looks like a section of the same black seats. But if you look a little bit closer, there's that area where there are like rails in front of you. And apparently it says something along the lines of like, you could, like these are here to stand or like we're something like encouraging fans to stand up, right? Um, because that section is really meant for fans. And then the other thing is that they want it to be Clippers fans. They want it to be people who are cheering. Apparently there are going to be people there who if you're not, cheering for the Clippers, if you're in another team's gear, they're going to remove you from that section. And uh, I read that, you know, you're, you know, some of the, the, the ticket holders in that area, they're allowed to like give their tickets away potentially or sell the tickets back. But if they do give it away, they're responsible for their friends or whomever they give it to, to still be rooting for the Clippers during those games. Um, but one of the big things that I, I want to tie that back into is that a lot of these major executions that they have, whether it's the wall or, you know, the technology around here, you know, ultimately, there, it seems like the team is very aware that a lot of this is still an experiment and could potentially go wrong. You know, when this stadium first opened, when the Dome first opened with Bruno Mars uh, a few months back, People were delayed, and front office sports reported on that, that people were delayed hours before they were able to get in. And as you walk around here in the stadium, you could tell that the people here are very much like, hey, good luck tomorrow. Hey, um, hopefully, you know, all goes well. Because there's an expectation that it might not always go right every single time, especially when you're relying on technology. And I think one of those things is also going to be the execution of the wall. Yeah, yeah it should be fascinating to see. Colin Zalo, enjoy the game. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks for giving the time. And again, stay tuned to our coverage so that, um, of, of what's going to come next. In the media environment we live in, engagement and attention can equal profit. And it doesn't always matter if that comes from reporting true things or just making stuff up. Our reporter, AJ Perez, spoke to the person behind the parody account NBA Sentel, which has become a major source of NBA fake news that people actually believe. We focus on sports for this conversation, but there are similar phenomena happening across the media. Here's my chat with AJ. I'm joined now by front office sports senior reporter, AJ Perez. Welcome, AJ. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, great to have you. So you've been looking into the NBA parody account, NBA Sentel, which has a little over 150,000 followers. To start, for the uninitiated, what kind of content does NBA Sentel post? This is a parody account for NBA Central, which that account, it's a basically NBA news account um, with uh, 1.7 million followers. Um, and uh, this kind of all started July 2023. This this NBA Centel account was known by a different handle. It was kind of straight news and it became a parody using kind of Balsack Sports. You remember Balsack Sports you profiled last year, kind of was like the originator of getting these fake quotes from athletes to trend because it even, it even got picked up by ESPN, Fox News, and other outlets as real news, even though the name is false exports. Very, very pretty apparent that it's probably not a serious news organization. Um, and this is kind of like, uh, I talked to Balsack for the story. I talked to NBA Centel for the story. And they keep, even 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 Centel was like, yeah, this false exports was my, was my inspiration. And this kind of uh, July 2023 was the same time NBA Central changed their 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 handle from NBA Central to Doug Central. That was done according to NBA Central. It sounded like more for fears of NBA, um, you know, legal coming after them for for calling themselves NBA Central when there's no NBA aff, um, affiliation at all. It was also the same time NBA Central stepped up and started doing that, changed the accounts, started doing these fake quotes um, that got almost immediately got got picked up by NBA Twitter. And uh, kind of people ran with it. And then eventually, I think a lot of people have since caught on. Yeah, I mean, I was just scrolling the account and sometimes it's pretty clear that this is parody. Other times, if you just, you know, you didn't know any better, seems reasonable enough. Um, and, you know, it looks like an account that might know what it's talking about. 
So yeah, obviously news outlets should do their research before they just say, this is what LeBron James said. Um, but if you're just a fan and you think, oh, that's a funny thing that LeBron James said, I'll, you know, I'll retweet this. I'll, you know, all of a sudden this thing's got a zillion impressions and that's how the NBA Centrals of the world make money. Exactly. And when you're a aggregator account like NBA Central, and we've done a lot of stuff on the NFL aggregator accounts, which aren't always accurate, which kind of push the envelope and sometimes spread fake news themselves. It's not hard to, it's kind of easy to see why, you know, NBA fans or just people on Twitter sorry, X, uh, kind of get duped because a lot of those aggregator accounts aren't, you know, don't have the rigorous, uh, you know, checks and balances that we have at FOS and many others, uh, all our, pretty much all our competitors do, you know, editors and fact checking and such. There's really none of that. So when you're spoofing and these accounts that aren't really known for accuracy um, already, it's it kind of, uh, you know, it kind of, you could say it exacerbates the problem or just becomes funnier. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of more of a, um, a slow creep than you might think. It's not just like there's the news and then there's parody. Um, it's there's the news. And then, there, yeah, there's these aggregator accounts that are all about speed um, being the first one to or the fir first to like of the aggregators uh, to announce the news. And so they're not fact checking for the most part. And so they, there's some real news. There's some not real news in there. And then there's plausible sounding parody which is like pretty close sounding to the aggregator stuff. Um, so yeah, if you're just someone who is scrolling social media, all these things like start to kind of blend together because the, the lines between them aren't super bright. Yeah, exactly. And there's, uh, you know, it, it, it takes a couple of clicks. It, it takes one click to figure out, to go on to NBA Centel and see the parody in there. It's, it's, it's in the profile. It's always been in the profile. People don't take that extra step. Also, NBA Centello used to tag actual reporters like Shams and other insiders. They stopped doing that, except for one exception, I'll explain. But now they're tagging impersonator accounts of these reporters. So it's now they're instead of tagging the real Shams, they're tagging a fake Shams with like 3,000 followers who's pretending to be Shams. So it's, it's, it is all part of the mis misinformation sphere in sports. Um, and, uh, 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 Scoop B, Scoop Robinson, um, who is uh, one of the the main insider I talked to for this story. You know, they he's actually in on the joke. It sounds like where he doesn't mind being tagged, but he's like the only reporter, real reporter, who gets tagged to these. And now going forward, you know, they basically tag you know these these fake reporters accounts that are all over the place. We've written about those before um, and how troublesome those can be. Um, but uh, it's also you know it's just all part of this whole kind of this is the this is the X that. Elon Musk created this monetization. You know, if you, if you got, you got not only NBA Centel, there's a bunch of copycats and NBA Centel tells us who's from Toronto tells us that none of those are his. There are, there are several. There's NFL Centel, there's WNBA Centel. So now it's like a, now it's like a cottage. Now it's like a cottage industry of BS. Um, and, uh, and just these spoof accounts try to, you know, this has only been about a year and three months. It's, this is still a new account. And we are been, we've got, got several copycats because, NBA Centel has done a good job of fooling people, a lot of them, and getting and seeing the angry reactions of people who don't who aren't in on the joke. Yeah, and just on that that tagging piece of it, that's an interesting detail because if they they tag Shams in a, a report, then it seems like you know they're both they're crediting their source and also they're like if if Shams like didn't say that, then he you know maybe he'll see that and he'll call them out, and so. You know, it, it seems like it's adding that much more credibility. But if they're tagging fake Shams or fake whoever, um, then it, it's just kind of like going. It, it's this self-perpetuating uh, ecosystem of lies, essentially, um, where people can make money on X because it's just about impressions and not about saying anything that's true. And Centel doesn't get those community notes as often as the aggregator account. The real aggregator accounts do because people expect them to be a little more accurate instead of a parody account, obviously, because really that's the only stop right now because X, you know, decimated their employees, their, uh, their head count and uh, started uh, and was, so there's no one policing this. So really the community notes is the only way to stop it. A community note would demonetize a post, but even the one that we, we led with about uh, LeBron talking about PDD's arrest, you know, which didn't happen. Uh, you know, that doesn't have a community note and that has about 8 million views. So that, so there, so NBA Centel, you know, he's made, he, he makes money off all that engagement and being a parody, obviously there's a, you know, there's not a really 
a lot of community notes. Snopes did a, did a post on it earlier this month on one of his posts, but it's kind of like there are no, you know, there there are no stops to uh, to or, or any negative negative connotations, negative uh, or implications to his money, his uh, checking account um, by 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 doing this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of clever to be just say I'm a parody account because most people don't notice that, but also people might not bother fact checking a parody account because it, it's already telling you it's fake. Um, in your conversations with the author of NBA Centel, um, it, I mean, do you get the sense of their motivation? Is this just they're making money and having fun? He's just having fun. It sounds like, yeah, yes, yeah. So they're 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 he's making money off this. Not only from um uh from uh, X's uh he's a, he's an X premium subscriber, so he gets the you know he gets money off of engagement. Uh, he also does uh he does uh, there's an offshore account uh, offshore sports betting account that 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 sponsors him. There's 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 other account, other betting accounts that he gets money off of through partnership deals. So it's uh you know this has become a he only has 150,000 followers. But his, you know, he goes viral a lot by fooling people and seeing people get, you know, you've been Centel, which is the Merriam-Webster Dictionary earlier this month kind of jokingly made a definition of. So it's kind of, so that's, uh, so that's, you know, that's, you know, he's, uh, he, he's a, uh, he was a hardcore Kobe fan, kind of lost, kind of lost some love for the NBA when Kobe uh, uh, died in 2020, uh, tragically. Um, so he does, and he says he doesn't have really an NBA team that he's a fan of. So this is all kind of just, you know, just for fun. AJ Perez, shining a light on a web of lies. Thanks very much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me on. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. The NFL is implementing its flex schedule for Week 9, bumping the Jaguars-Eagles game from the primetime slot in favor of Colts-Vikings. The point of flex scheduling is to give the league some flexibility whenever a match they had originally anticipated as primetime worthy doesn't quite fit the bill, such as Jaguars-Eagles. At the beginning of the season, the Eagles were expected to be a powerhouse in the NFL, and the Jaguars had promised behind quarterback Trevor Lawrence. Since then, the Eagles have looked shaky despite going 4-2 so far, and the Jaguars have mustered up a measly 2-5 record. Instead, we get to watch a matchup between the 5-1 Vikings, led by a surprisingly good Sam Darnold, and a promising Colts team that sits at 4-3 on the year. Expect to see more of this as the NFL is experimenting with Thursday and Monday night flex scheduling this season. That's it for today. Leave us a rating or review wherever you like to tune in, or tell your friends about the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.